This algebraic geometry lecture will be about elliptic functions and we'll be using them to show that several cubic curves in the plane are not birational to the affine line. The previous lecture proved this using an algebraic method, so this lecture is going to be different because we're going to use an analytic method. So we have to recall the definition of the Weierstrass p function, p of z. This funny squiggle is actually a letter p. It's uh, um, some sort of weird calligraphic letter p from some 19th century calligraphic alphabet. And as far as I know, every letter of this alphabet has been lost except for the capital p, which was used by Weierstrass for his function as, and has been copied by mathematicians ever since. Anyway, the Weierstrass p function is an elliptic function. So an elliptic function is one such that f of z plus lambda is equal to f of z for all lambda in some lattice L in the complex plane. So a lattice is just something that looks something like this. So if this is naught and this is A and this is B, then the lattice consists of all integral linear combinations of A and B. So for example, A plus B, 2A and so on. So, so this function has two periods, A and B. Now the function cannot be holomorphic unless it's constant because it's, if it were holomorphic, it would be bounded in a fundamental domain and therefore bounded everywhere. So it'd have to be constant by Liouville's theorem. So F has to be um, meromorphic. It must have poles somewhere. So how can we find functions F with this property? Well, one obvious way of finding it is to find, take any function G and just sum over all lambda in the lattice. Um, I seem to have been confused about whether I'm calling it L or lambda. So we sum over all elements of the lattice lambda. And if we define F of Z like this, then it's completely obvious that F of Z plus lambda will equal F of Z. So what do we choose for G? Well, it has to be something with a pole, otherwise um, um, it, so, sorry, it has to be something that converges. This means it must decrease reasonably fast at infinity. Well, let's try G of Z equals one over Z. Well, in that case, it's easy to check that this doesn't converge. Um, see, the, the, the number of lambdas with absolute value less than some constant c grows quadratically in c, and this only decreases linearly in c, so that's not good enough. If we take gz equals 1 over z cubed, this converges well. If we take gz equals 1 over z squared, this is borderline. Um, by borderline, I mean it doesn't converge, but it only just fails to converge by the sort of minimum possible amount it could fail but like. What this means is that if we modify this very slightly, we can actually get it to converge. So the Weierstrass p function is defined like this. We take um, p of z uh, to be 1 over z squared plus sum over lambda not equal to 0 of 1 over um, z minus lambda squared minus 1 over lambda squared. And what you see we've done is we've just added a sort of constant. And a constant is doubly periodic, so in some doubly periodic, so adding all these constants shouldn't really affect the fact that this is doubly periodic. Um, and the nice thing about this constant is that it's the constant term of this expression here. So if z is large, then um, 1 over z minus lambda squared is approximately 1 over lambda squared plus even smaller terms. So what we're essentially doing is adding this sort of um, 
this constant sum of lambda does not equal zero of one over lambda squared to everything. The trouble is this does not converge. So this is not convergent. Um, but we're sort of adding this non-convergent expression to this non-convergent expression and producing a convergent expression. So we've got a perfectly well-defined function. There's one slight problem that since we've twiddled everything by adding in this constant, it's no longer clear that this is doubly periodic. However, this is not very difficult to show because if we take the derivative of this, then um, we're essentially summing all the translates of one over one plus c cubed, which is convergent up to some constant. Oh, the derivative of this is one over z cubed up to a constant. That should be a three. Um, so the derivative of this is doubly periodic. And this means that this function here is doubly periodic up to a constant. So we find that rho of z plus a is equal to, so not rho, p of z plus some constant. And this constant is, must be zero because this function here is an even function. So the fact this is even implies this is constant. So um, this slight change the definition to make this convergent fortunately doesn't affect the fact that this is still doubly periodic. You've got to be a bit careful with this argument because there are some quite similar functions where you do this trick and adding in this constant actually stops it from being periodic. But anyway, we've got a nice doubly periodic function. Um, next, um, we have a look at the Laurent expansion of P by Streis' P function at z equals zero. And this isn't very difficult to work out. It's one over um, z squared. Um, and the constant term vanishes, so we get naught times z plus something times z squared. And we don't really care all that much for what this is. So we can look at the derivative. Well, this is going to be minus 2z to the minus 3 um, plus um, um, again, the, the constant term is going to vanish and we're just going to get a linear term, something in z. Now we take the derivative and square it. Well, um, this is going to be 4z to the minus 6 plus something times z to the minus 2 plus something times z to the 0 plus something. Um, on the other hand, um, we can take p of z cubed and multiply it by 4, and this will be 4z to the minus 6 plus something times z to the minus squared and so on. Now, you see, these terms cancel out, and we're just left with terms in z to the minus squared and a constant term. So what we can do is we can take rho prime of z squared, and this will be equal to 4 rho of z cubed plus something times p of z. I'm sorry, I keep calling this rho. I should be saying p. So we take something times p to cancel out the term in z to the minus 2, and then we take some constant to cancel out the constant terms, and then plus something that vanishes at z equals 0. So this is doubly periodic, and it has no poles and vanishes at z equals zero. Well, if it's doubly periodic and has no poles, it's bounded in a fundamental region, so it must be constant. And since it vanishes at zero, it must actually be zero. So um, this expression here, must actually vanish. So we find that Weierstrass p function satisfies the following differential equation. Plus some constant times rho, which is traditionally called minus g2 for 
complicated historical reasons. That satisfies this equation here. Okay, well, what on earth is the point of that? And the other question is why are these things called elliptic functions when they seem to have nothing to do with ellipses? Well, answer the second question first because it's a little bit easier. The reason why these things are called elliptic functions is if you work out the arc length of an ellipse, it ends up with integrals like integral of dx over the square root of 4x cubed minus ax minus b. So this is arc length of an ellipse. So these integrals are called um, um, elliptic integrals. Now, if you look at the denominator of this, it looks very similar to this bit of the Weierstrass p function. In fact, you find the Weierstrass p function as an inverse. If you, if you sort of invert it, it's um, you, 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 you get the inverse function as the integral from something to p of the integral of d p over the square root of 4p cubed minus g2 p um, minus g3, it should be a g2. So the inverse of this elliptic function p is more or less given by this elliptic integral. And um, someone, I'm not, I can't quite remember who first noticed that these things are doubly periodic, but the inverses of these functions are doubly periodic. So doubly periodic functions end up being called elliptic functions. As you can see, the connection with ellipses is very roundabout and it's really rather dreadful terminology, but it's probably too late to change it. Anyway, now let's go back to algebraic geometry and look at the equation 4y squared equals x cubed minus g2x minus g3. So this is some sort of um, cubic plane curve. It might look something like this. So here we've got a some sort of affine plane curve. And um, if you look at the equation, differential equation for the Weierstrass p function, you see it looks very much like the equation for this cubic curve, if we put y, uh, sorry, I put the four in the wrong place, the four should be there. If we put y equals the derivative of the Weierstrass p function of z and x equals p of z, then we see at the point x, y lies on this curve. So what's this saying? It's saying that we've got a map from the complex numbers onto the set of, onto the curve y squared equals 4x cubed minus g2x minus g3, which takes a point z to um, p dash of z, p of z. Well, that's not quite true because this is actually not defined when z is in the lattice. So this should really be c minus the lattice l and it maps this onto the curve. Well, it's a bit annoying having to remove the lattice points. So we can actually get a map from c to the projective curve where you remember we, we turn this into a curve in the projective plane and just add a point at infinity. And of course, this maps the point zero to the point at infinity of this projective curve. Well, this is a doubly periodic function. So we actually get a map from the complex plane modulo the lattice L to this projective curve. And it's not too difficult to check. This is actually a homeomorphism of topological spaces. Now, this projective curve is very nice. If you take C and think of it as being R squared modulo a lattice, 
that's just r modulo a lattice times r modulo a lattice so this is isomorphic to s1 cross s1 as a topological space in other words it's just a torus which you can picture like this so over the complex numbers this curve if you add a point at infinity is homeomorphic to a two-dimensional torus and this implies that it can't be rational because any rational curve is the same as p1 up to a finite number of points And P1 over the complex numbers is just isomorphic to a sphere S2. So we've, we've just got a, a, a nice sphere there. On the other hand, the curve um, y squared equals 4x cubed minus g2x minus g3 over the complex numbers, this is topologically isomorphic to a torus. Um, S1 times S1. And there is no way to turn a torus into a sphere by removing a finite number of points and adding a finite number of other points. Um, now, if we had a rational map between these two spaces, the rational map would be defined except for the finite number of points, and it would have an inverse that was well defined except for the finite number of points. So any two curves that are birational are the same topologically if you're allowed to add and, add and subtract a finite number of points. So these two curves are not birational. Um, by the way, I'll just, just make a quick comment. Um, so we've constructed um, a doubly periodic function by taking a sum 1 over z minus lambda squared, um, except we're not really taking this because it doesn't quite converge, but we can make it converge by um, sort of fiddling around a little bit. You might wonder, why don't we do this with singly periodic functions? Well, you can. You can take the sum, sum of 1 over z minus lambda, and this does not converge. Well, it's not absolutely convergent, but it's so close to being convergent that it's very easy to make it convergent. In fact, you can make it convergent by summing it carefully in, in um, by, by carefully summing over lambda in order of absolute value, and then it becomes conditionally convergent, but not absolutely convergent. And this is a periodic function. It's not difficult to figure out which. It's actually pi times the cotangent of pi z. Um, when people are doing trigonometry, they don't often mention this, I think, because you do trigonometry at um, high school or something. And at high school, you're not allowed to talk about complex numbers. Um, th this actually gives rise to the product formula for the sine function, because you can write sine pi of z is equal to z times a product over n not equal to zero of one minus c over n. Well, we've got to be a bit careful about this product because that sum is not convergent and this product is actually not convergent either unless you're a little bit careful about the order. Um, so what's the relation between these? Well, if you take the logarithmic derivative of both sides, then this identity here becomes this identity here. Um, so, um, the analog of the Weierstrass function is really just this function here. Um, incidentally, this product formula also has an analog for the Weierstrass function, but that's that's getting to the very interesting theory of um, theta functions, but that's not, strictly speaking, part of algebraic geometry, so I'll stop there for the moment.